Welcome to The Realtor Lady. I'm Michelle Riplogel. Hi, this is Michelle, and you're with The Realtor Lady. And today, we have the curator of the Capitola Historical Museum here in Capitola, California, with Frank Perry. Frank, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the history of Capitola. Uh, I uh, grew up in uh, the area. I was born in Santa Cruz and uh, grew up in uh, Live Oak. Uh, actually, my family uh, settled in the Live Oak area about 100 years ago. So I, I do have some roots that go back a ways in Santa Cruz County history, which is kind of fun. And I went to local schools, including uh, Cabrillo College and UCSC. So I'm very much a uh, Santa Cruz-y kind of person. <laughs> um, and just for me, because I lived in Live Oak for 22 years, what street? I got to know. Well, we originally lived on 17th Avenue, where Staples is now. Yes. And now I live out on uh, in the Pleasure Point area. There you go. Yeah, I um, bought a house on Rodriguez in uh, 1994. It was like... In, in my mind, after after living in the city, coming to the county, it was like barely paved. And that was like 94. It was still so rural even at that point. But anyway, it's all paved over well, now. Live Oak has been uh, filling in. I see where they're on Capitola Road. There's going to be another big development going in. Yes, yes. Long time coming. Uh, I had hoped at one point it would be a grocery store, but that just never worked out. There's just not a good grocery store in that area. But anyway, um, you have some uh, tips or, uh, sorry, you have some things you were going to tell me about Capitola and who developed it. And maybe then you'll give me a, like a, a brief history of Capitola if there is such a thing. <laughs> well, Capitola has, a, I think, a, really a fascinating uh, history. It's, it's a little bit different from most of the other communities in, uh, or towns in Santa Cruz County. Most have uh, an industrial origin uh, with logging or agriculture or things like that, such as Boulder Creek, Felton, Davenport, Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Soquel. But Capitola was founded as a resort. It was originally called Camp Capitola. It was started in the early 1870s. Uh, and at that time, the, the property was owned by a man by the name of Frederick Augustus Heen, spelled H-I-H-N, but pronounced Heen, who was uh, quite the developer around Santa Cruz. He also had a lot of uh, lumber mills up in the mountains and helped get the first railroad put through. So he was the kind of mastermind behind Capitola, and he gradually developed it uh, over the years. It started out with just people staying in tents, and then later on, uh, little cabins were added and various stores, and eventually a nice hotel was built, and he started selling uh, lots for people who wanted to have summer homes there. And so it was uh, quite a nice little town by uh, 1913, which is when uh, Heen uh, passed away. So would that be uh, the hotel and then those, uh, you're saying tents to cabins here down at the Esplanade, uh, this, the historic lawn area, or where exactly was that at? Uh, the, you mean the hotel? Yeah. The hotel was where Esplanade Park and Britannia Arms are located today. Uh, he, that's the, well, he had a smaller hotel there at first in the 1880s. But in 1895, he built a, a big hotel and he added on to it in 1899. So I think it was uh, 165 rooms altogether three stories, beautiful wooden uh, Victorian hotel, which shows up in many, many old uh, photographs of Capitola. 
Now, unfortunately, uh, like a lot of those old hotels that have it caught fire and uh, burned down in uh, 1929. And did he have a hand in building the Venetians? No, that came later. He died, uh, Heen died in 1913. And uh, when he died, his estate was uh, divided up among his various children. And to his oldest daughter, Catherine, he left Capitola. How'd you like to inherit a whole town? <laughs> Uh, but she wasn't all that interested in, or I guess didn't really do a very good job of uh, running it as a resort. And so after only about five years, she uh, sold it to a man by the name of Henry Allen Rispin, who was an oil millionaire who decided to get out of the oil business and try his hand as a, a real estate developer. He wasn't very good at it. But it was, it was during the Rispin era in 1924 that the Venetian court was built. It was uh, developed by some uh, people from Santa Clara. But Rispin was also involved because he sold the, the individual lots under each unit. Wow. Okay. Hmm. I didn't know that. You know, we only hear about the Rispin mansion, so... Um... Well, Rispin uh, bought Capitola in late 1919, and he uh, he wanted to give it a facelift first. He wanted to fix it up. I mean, he had managed it with a lot of love and care, but over the years, it had gotten a little haphazard, and some things had fallen into disrepair. And so Rispin hired a San Francisco architect by the name of George McCrae, to uh, come down and live in Capitola for a while and develop new plans for remodeling the town and to, to oversee uh, redevelopment. So he tore down a lot of buildings and moved other buildings around. He put the curve in the esplanade that wasn't there before and uh, made a lot of changes and kind of brought Capitola into the 20th century. So he was... I mean, he might have not been financially successful, but that's pretty artistic. I mean, it, it's very unique. It's kind of hard to know. I've been doing a lot of research on this subject, and it's sort of hard to know uh, which of the ideas were Mr. Rispin's and which were ones that uh, were developed by McRae, which he then got approval uh, from uh, Rispin. But Rispin certainly deserves credit for hiring uh, McRae, who had a lot of experience not only designing uh, houses, but a lot of uh, churches and also some schools. Yeah, I mean, he, he hired the, the right guy and probably let him do it. That's the other part. Sort of like um, William Randolph Hearst hiring uh, Julia Morgan. Oh my gosh, yeah. I, I went back to Hearst Castle this and the second time, I was much more interested in her than him. That was the uh -huh. difference between being eight and being 50. I, you know, at eight, I was just like, this is amazing. I can't believe this guy had all this stuff. And then when I got older, I was like, I just wanted to know more about her. And he just, I mean, it was almost like a Sarah Winchester thing. He just kind of let her keep kind of going. And it was, it was amazing. Well, architects in those days and uh, McRae and, and, uh, Morgan were kind of uh, contemporaries. Uh, architects in those days uh, did a lot more than uh, they do today. They had to know everything. They not only designed the buildings, but they also did surveying. They were the engineer for the project. In some cases, they also acted as the uh, the contractor for the project, making arrangements for the different uh, wor workers to uh, to build the build the house or whatever. And they even got into more things. Some of them would design the furniture for the house. If you're familiar with, uh, um, well, I can't think of his name, Frank Lloyd Wright. He, he designed furniture for some of the houses that he did. And I just, uh, speaking of Julia Morgan, I, I was just reading uh, uh, a de detailed biography of Julia Morgan and one of the buildings up in Berkeley uh, it was the I think the Berkeley 
city women's club. She not only designed the building, which was a large building, even had an indoor swimming pool, she even designed the china. I, I did know she did that building, but I also know that the Hearst Castle really spent a lot of her creative talent. She was she was a little done after that, which is kind of sad. Well, she had a big crew of uh, drafts people working for her. It wasn't just her. I just think he was a hard taskmaster. I don't know. I read a lot about her. She just seemed to be, that seemed to be, <laughs> he kind of used up a lot of her gas. Um, okay, so we are still at Rispin owning, and what year again is that? Well, he bought Capitola in 1919 and developed, worked on developing it through the 20s, but uh, he wasn't very successful in uh, selling uh, lots for vacation homes. And he made the mistake of pouring a lot of money into improvements, which were nice, but didn't really bring more people to Capitola. And so he put all this money in, but he, he didn't get a very good return from it. In fact, he had to mortgage Capitola in order to try to pay for all the stuff he wanted to do. And uh, in 19, at the end of the decade, around 1930, uh, he couldn't make the mortgage payments anymore. Uh, so the savings and loan foreclosed on him and he lost the town. Wow. So was he watching the Santa Cruz boardwalk and all the activity there and thinking that should be here. I mean, what was his idea? Well, he was involved. I mean, he was from San Francisco, but he was involved uh, when he first came here. He was involved uh, in the area. His son went to Santa Cruz High School and he uh, joined the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And uh, so he looked at, he tried to come up with ways to uh, partner with the city of Santa Cruz on different things. They held uh, some various events. So when Santa Cruz started hosting the, what eventually became the Miss California contest, uh, Capitola let several of the uh, contestants uh, stay at the Capitola Hotel and they had a big, big uh, celebration for them there. So, so he, he was involved in the larger community as well. Mm -hmm. I'm probably wondering why Capitola couldn't get a piece of what Santa Cruz was getting. Sounds like to me. Um, before we leave, he uh, he had buildings downtown Santa Cruz. He has a street named after him in Ben Loman. He was everywhere. Yeah, there's there actually are very considering how influential he was in late 1800s and very early 1900s. Santa Cruz County history. There are very few things named for him. There are a couple of streets and uh, there's a teeny tiny park in Capitola called Heen Park. It's probably the smallest park in the entire county, uh, but there's not that much. Uh, he, he wasn't into naming things for himself. Uh, let's put it that way. And what's your sense of what he was like? Was he someone, you said he, 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 had affection for the community or it seemed like when he put the hotel was he hotel baron or was he was he he liked it here and he wanted to see it grow what's a, what like? well this emphasis was on santa cruz county and he he really liked uh, this area uh, some people have called him a land grabber he was out to uh get a hold of the land that he could uh, make money off of, mainly through logging. But he did have interests in some other areas. He also owned a share in the uh, big hotel that was in Paso Robles at the time. And he was also, I think, one of the founding uh, board trustees or whatever you call it, of, uh, of Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. So some of his interests did stretch outside of Santa Cruz County. Mm -hmm. But but he was uh, he was a micromanager. He had very tight control over everything, and uh, he was on the board of supervisors for a while, and in the state legislature. And uh, so he was very very uh, influential, uh, powerful person in the county at that time. And did he die 
with his money, some of these guys don't. Rispin, for example, how did he fare? With well, uh, he was uh, very, very wealthy. He had a very large estate when he uh, died. He had a huge mansion, uh, which was where uh, City Hall is now in Santa Cruz. In fact, he sold the property uh, across this uh, part of his property uh, for the current uh, library site. That was his property. He also owned the uh, water company, so he he was he had his hand in all kinds of things. He was enterprise. So was is that a different house that's across the street from the, the uh, city building? Because that's the he. Uh, yeah, well, the, his mansion was really about where the city hall annex is now. Right. And uh, that was demolished uh, after they built the new, the current uh, city hall in the 1930s. Right. Which is too bad, you know. These these Santa Cruz had a lot of big, beautiful Victorian mansions. And there are a few left, but there are a lot more that uh, were demolished. People think, well, that's old fashioned. We don't want that anymore. And they tore them down. And that really uh, sad. It is. A lot of them burned down though. Uh, up along Walnut, there's an area in there that quite a few of them burned down. I had found out doing some research on a property I was selling. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we found out, I was doing it with uh, Jeff Dunn. We were kind of trying to figure out how this property even came to be because it's not anywhere on the maps. We figure it was a um, either a servant's quarters or some out ancillary building that actually turned. It, now it's a house, but it it was not the main house. And the house on the corner of Walnut and Mission burned down. And then there was just this, tragedy of like five houses that just died, uh, died uh, burned down uh, within a very short amount of time. So that happened too a lot. Um, so after, okay, so Rispin's here, he loses it. So where do we go from there? Well, the proper, the Capitola was put up for auction, but the auction kept getting postponed. And it turned out the reason why is that a uh, business partner of Rispin by the name of Robert Hayes Smith, who was very wealthy, much more wealthy than Rispin, uh, he wanted to step in once he got uh, more cash on hand and uh, buy it. So the, Mr. Smith uh, bought it uh, from the bank, and, but then he went back or went up bankrupt. But he went; he lost a lot of his money in the as the de depression progressed. By about 1937, he didn't have any money, so he he didn't have, own capital anymore, and so it uh, got divided up into uh, a lot of different owners. It, it Rispin left behind a big mess and legally because uh, there were all these different properties and owners and mortgages and things. At one point, the people in Capitola wanted the county to fix up the streets, but it turns out the streets were owned by a bank. <laughs> and they, so the county didn't want to put money into fixing up streets that it didn't own. So there was a lot of things had to be straightened out. Did anybody think there was a curse on Capitola at some point? Like Keen put some sort of curse on the area or was it just straight the depression? Well, it, it eventually things got straightened out and uh, by the 1950s and the 60s, uh, most of the legal hassles were uh, solved. Although I, I saw some uh, le legal notice in the newspaper that re related back to the Rispin era that the city put in just to protect themselves. You know, Rispin had been dead for 50 years and they were still, <laughs> just in case there was, you know, one of the stockholders in his Bayhead Land Company was still uh, alive. They put this legal notice uh, in the paper about something. So I thought that was pretty funny. And was that recently or when you were... Uh, that was uh, about only about that was in the early 2000s, I believe. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And and um, so then it got divided into uh, was there somebody who kind of came in and still 
developed it even more. I remember coming here as a little kid. I played uh, games here on the Esplanade. It was just, just kind of this hangout. Well, we got dropped off and left here. The the grownups went back home. I, they was just the play area. We went to the beach. And yeah, a lot of people did. Did you ride the merry-go-round? No. We that didn't. wasn't there when you were around? You know, I don't know. We were only about ski ball. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, well, the merry-go-round has been gone quite a long time now, but uh, there used to be a merry-go-round and, of course, the theater. But, yeah, I've done uh, I done quite a few interviews with people for what I call the Capitola Memories Project, which is on our uh, Capitola Historical Museum YouTube channel. And I've done 30 or 40 interviews, and a lot of the people have those same kind of uh, wonderful memories of visiting the place as a kid and their parents just dropping them off to have the run of the beach and the arcade uh, games and so forth. They've recently brought arcade games back to Capitola. There's an arcade in the, uh, as you may know, in the mercantile building. Oh, no, I haven't been in there. I haven't been in there in a, quite a while. Um, I just remember in the, after that, and I got older, it was pretty much closed down during the winter. There was risk of flood. It was, it just wasn't as vibrant as it is now pretty much almost all year round. For many years, Capitola pretty much closed down in, in the winter, and it can still be very quiet in Capitola if it's cold and rainy. But if it's sunny, even in the wintertime, uh, there's a lot of people around. Yes. Uh, the big change to Capitola and Santa Cruz County in general uh, came in the 1960s with the arrival of, of UCSC, which brought a, a year-around population of students into the town. And also, or winter time, I should say, fall, winter, and spring uh, of uh, students. And also, uh, of course, Silicon Valley has uh, kind of spilled into Santa Cruz County and uh, brought a lot of people here. It didn't even occur to me till you said it, though, too, really, a lot of the UCSC families come as well. I work with families whose parents love that they come here because they can visit them and then they can visit the town. So you bring you you, you bring one student and you, you times it times five to ten you know people coming. Well, I, I know somebody who uh, moved here. Uh, she moved here with her husband. Her husband got a job as a professor in the early 1970s, and then uh, her parents moved here to be near their uh, daughter and grandchildren, and then her two. Uh, other family members moved here. So that, that's a good example of what you were just talking about. Yeah. Growing up, I didn't, I wasn't aware of UCSC and I grew up on Bay Street, but I just had no idea. They really weren't in the town. I was downtown and I was all over the West side, but I mean, it's not like now mm -hmm. at all. And I was not even, I didn't even know what UCSC was when I was a kid. And, well, when I went there, it had about uh, 6,000 students, I think. Right. Now it has, I believe, uh, eighteen or 18,000, around that. Yeah, we probably shouldn't get on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some people, I mean, I went to UCSC, so I, I love the place, but uh, uh, it. Uh, I, I have talked to old-time uh, Santa Cruzans who think UCSC is the worst worst thing that ever happened to Santa Cruz. So uh, <laughs> you have very different uh, opinions on that. You know, I actually, um, I think it's fine. I just think their growth policies really need to be more in line with the community and less in their own interests. And that's my opinion. So, Well, I really like the fact that they started early on collecting a lot of Santa Cruz history stuff. And so uh, I've spent a lot of time there in the library doing uh, research. And do you do research just on Santa Cruz or just on Capitola? Or do you try to, I mean, there's so much. Um, but how do you, I mean, I, I would imagine you could kind of go nuts with all the. Well, everybody who studies local history has their specialty. And over the past eight years, as curator of the Capitola Historical Museum, most of my research has focused on uh, Capitola when I needed to do research. I did research for uh, exhibits, which we change each year. 
and I did a, uh, a book on Capitola history. Um, but I, I started out doing uh, research on in 19, early 1980s on the history of the original Santa Cruz Lighthouse and did a book on that, which is still out. Then I did two other books on Central California lighthouses. And then about 20 years ago, I got really interested in uh, lime kilns and the history of the lime industry in Santa Cruz County. And I did a book with several others called Lime Kiln Legacies, which took about five years and it's about 250 pages, but it was just such a wonderful experience researching that topic and, and really getting to know intimately this one little facet of uh, Santa Cruz County history. It's, it's, it's an amazing history. It is, it is. Um, what's something surprising you found out about Capitola and in, in your years at the, at the museum, something that you... Something surprising. Well, when I started out, I didn't know that much about Capitola, even though I grew up uh, a mile away. Uh, my predecessor at the museum, Carolyn Swift, uh, she's a little older than I am. And when I was in high school, she was doing weekly articles on Capitola history for the newspaper. So she, had, she was kind of the Capitola person and all the rest of us who studied local history, we said, okay, we just let, let Carolyn have Capitola. <laughs> we'll work on something else. So when I started, I had to, uh, I had a lot to learn and it probably took me a year or two to uh, get up to speed. And uh, I'm still learning uh, new things. As for what is the most interesting thing I learned that, you know, offhand, that would be, uh, be hard to say, but uh, it, it's it's all fascinating. I think uh, probably just what I learned today. I've, I've learned so much already. Thank you so much. But um, Heen had his hand in the whole county. So on my end of town, Heen is very prevalent, and I knew he was here, but I, I just I don't connect. I mean, it's so crazy because we have the kind of west side or east side, or we have our little areas that we live in. But he obviously was just. He was all over the place. So that's my surprise. And that Rispin owned Capitola. I think I didn't catch that in my very short newspaper articles talking about that mansion and what they're going to do with it. They Well, he, uh, yeah, both Heen and then later Rispin uh, owned Capitola and also Heen's daughter, Catherine Cope Henderson. She had it for about five years. But when we say owned Capitola, they own a lot of the land, but they, and they own the commercial property. He retained the commercial property, but he did sell lots for vacation homes. So he didn't, these people did not own every single right. uh, house, but uh, they own the, the streets and the water system, the infrastructure, uh, the commercial property, and any lots that hadn't been sold yet. Are there any families from that long ago that still own any bit of property? Uh, there are Heen uh, descendants still around. None of them have the last name of Heen. That name seems to have died out. But uh, in fact, uh, one of his, uh, I think, great grandsons or something like that uh, loaned a, a beautiful family uh, artifact, a, a table that had belonged to F.A. Heen for one of our uh, exhibits. So, yeah, they're, they're still around. Um, what's your what's your exhibit this year? What's your what's your focus? This year? The current exhibit is called Capitola Then and Now, which is a really fun topic. I uh, went through the museum's photo collection and uh, pulled out various historical photographs, and then went out and took the same scene today, and then put them side by side. Uh, so it's a really fun uh, comparison. In some cases, things haven't changed all that much. And in other cases, it's changed so much you, you wouldn't know it was the same place. So it's a lot of fun. I'm reading the history of Ray Kroc right now, McDonald's. And it, it may not seem related, but it, it is to me and how Capitola and tourist towns have changed based on cars and how cars changed things. 
and people being able to go just a little further. So we have people from Fresno and Bakersfield that would come here and, you know, come here for a week and how we changed around them to make sure it was more, you know, convenient for them to bring their car and how we served them and how we housed them and, and all that change is, is, is very fascinating. Well, Capitola early on was successful as a resort because it was right on the railroad line. So people could come here from San Francisco or the Bay Area or other parts of California and get dropped off right in Capitola. And like you say, spend uh, a few days or maybe several weeks. And uh, it's funny, they, the early ads for Capitola would advertise that, that they had a good uh, place for your, for your horses, <laughs> a nice stable, corrals for your horses. I guess that's for people who arrive by horse and buggy. The horses would love it here, though. I mean, it gets foggy and cool in the evening if they're coming from hotter areas. Boy, the horses just must have loved it here. You asked earlier about interesting things that I found out. And fairly recently, in delving into Rispin and his architect, George McRae, I found out some some quite fascinating things about McRae and his early proposals for, for what he thought should be done to Capitola. One of the things he suggested way back in 1919 was that uh, automobiles be banned from Capitola Village. <laughs> he was gonna he was gonna make it all pedestrians from south of Capitola Avenue and, and east of Stockton Avenue. And this was an and people, oil guy. <laughs> and people still talk about that once in a while. So it uh, hasn't happened yet. And, and another thing he said, which really surprised me is he, and this didn't happen, but he uh, urged that all uh, w wires and utility poles be put underground and hidden. And that didn't happen till uh, the late 70s and early 80s. So he was ahead of his time. <laughs> he was. I mean, it, it, at that point, when I was being dropped off and they had made it a pedestrian area only, then that would have that would have been ideal at the period when it wasn't as popular. I think now it would be very hard to do, but very wise. I find this very clogged up down here. I park as far away and just walk in because, like you said, you wanted to get out because it's it's messy. Yeah, he was going to uh, put up like a meandering pedestrian pathway through the center of the Esplanade. And right at the end of uh, San Jose Avenue was going to be a, a fountain. Oh, well, you know, we could still lobby for that. <laughs> so the theater got to, I, I went to that theater all the time with those wonderful cranky ladies who I loved. Um, and then the theater got torn down and a hotel was going to go in. What's happening with that? Oh, I don't know uh, the current status of that project. The developer still uh, owns it and is just hanging on to the land, I guess, until the uh, time is right to uh, come up with a hotel proposal. Uh, Capitola had a, a movie theater. Um, again, that was something that McRae designed and built for Capitola in uh, 1920, opened in June of 1920, but it was on San Jose Avenue. Mm, okay. Only lasted about a year, and then they, uh, I guess it didn't sell enough tickets, so they turned it into an arcade. And then, I mean, it lasted about 10 years, about a decade. And then the uh, the theater that most of us remember uh, opened in uh, 48, as I recall, and then was torn down in the very early 2000s. Yeah, I love that theater. That, that has a lot of memories for me. Um, yes, well, in the current exhibit, then and now Capitola, we have a display about the theater, and we have the original uh, pedestal that the movie projector sat on, and also some of the reels that were uh, saved. Oh, wow. Now, I visited the little uh, cabin, as it were, there by the police station. Where is the museum? 
Uh, well, the museum is at 410 Capitola Avenue. There is a little cottage exhibit uh, out front, but the museum is right next to that. And we are open uh, right now, uh, Saturday and Sunday afternoons from noon to four. And if we, uh, as the pandemic winds down, I hope, uh, we'll probably go back more towards our regular hours, which included uh, Thursday and Friday, uh, noon to four as well. But right now, for sure, we're open on the weekend afternoons. Okay. And it's free. Oh, that was my next question. <laughs> and who supports you? Is this the city of Capitola or you have- It's a municipal museum. Uh, it, it's the city of Capitola. Uh, I am a city employee. Okay. Um, but we also, we also, I should add that we also uh, get uh, a lot of uh, donations from people uh, in the community. And that also uh, helps uh, make, and, and of course, donations of time. We have 30 or 40 volunteers who help out at the museum, uh, mainly as uh, greeters at the front desk, answer questions and so forth. So that was been, been one of the great things about this job of museum curator is that Capitol has been so very uh, welcoming to me from the very beginning and uh, Everybody uh, in Capitola loves their little museum and is uh, glad to support it. And just from my side, I my uh, own personal slant is I really, whether people want it or not, if I'm selling houses, I like people to know history of the area. I want them to be aware of the area. And, you know, people like yourself and and even Carolyn helped me out a little bit and, and uh there's people I can reach out to, to just give me a little bit more of a sense that way. I, I, maybe some people don't want the history, but I like people to really be, have a little bit of an understanding of the community that they're buying into. And I think it's a very special area. So they're, they're going to get my two cents about it. But before we go, can you just touch a little bit on Camp Capitola up uh, on the hillside? Um, the houses that were built up there. Well, I see you pointing, but I don't know what direction that is. You mean Depot I Hill? I you're pointing. I'm pointing to myself. I didn't even know you could see me. Um, above the trestle, just uh, all the little houses. I stayed in one of the little houses there, actually, when I was a kid. Um, just Was that uh, part of any of those developments? On the east, east side of Capitola? Um, at the top of the stairs, you mean? Yes, all up in there. So what is that? Um, That's Depot Hill. Depot Hill. Oh, yes. Oh, uh I think you're thinking of the other side. So as you go up East Cliff on the other side of the train tracks, why do I want to say Palisades? It's not Palisades. It's um, Jewel Box. Okay, the Jewel Box area. Yeah, well, that's on the west side. Mm -hmm. And that was, was that sold off by a developer? A lot of those little houses were the same. Is that? Uh, that area, they had several different names in the early years. It used to be called uh, Camp Fairview. And uh, Heen eventually uh, bought that as well. And it was subdivided and uh, developed uh, gradually, gradually filled in over the years. At some point, I think, I'm not sure when, it's kind of murky, but sometime in the 1940s or 50s, uh, to help promote it for real estate purposes. Uh, somebody nicknamed it the Jewel Box because the streets were named after different jewels. Right. And that name has kind of uh, stuck. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're little, little tiny streets, but there's some very cute little houses in there. That's a wonderful neighborhood. I know quite a few people who who live in that area and um, it's very nice. Yeah, it's, it's- And you got a big park right close by too there, Jade Street Park. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize I was staying in such an old home when I was a kid, but we slept on the screen porch in the summer, which was freezing. I remember that, <laughs> but we could get to the beach easily. So that was, that was all we really cared about, and they let us. Well, here it is May, and we have already are into our summer weather now, fog in the mornings. Yeah, it's freezing today. Mm -hmm. Well, I 
don't need to keep you anymore. I really appreciate your time. Um, so you're open Saturday and Sundays, 12 to 4. Do you expect you would get more hours this summer? Or is that pretty much the I, I hope so. Yeah, I hope we can uh, expand to doing uh, Thursday and Friday afternoons as well, too. But at the moment, it's mostly uh, Saturday and uh, Sunday afternoons. And these are self-guided tours through the museum? Yeah, yeah. We there's there's uh, somebody there to uh, answer questions, and uh, we have uh, some books on local history that are available if people are interested. And we always welcome donations, but uh, it is uh, free, and people can uh, enjoy the current exhibit. Well, that sounds very nice. I will I will promote that. And I really appreciate you taking the time and telling me more about Capitola and filling in some of the gaps or some stuff I really did not know, especially about Rispin. And um, that's it. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, be part of your podcast. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Hey, thank you for listening. If you want to talk more, find me on livethesantacruzlife.com, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or give me a call. My number's in the show notes. Love to hear from you.